Welcome to Financial Plan and Explained. I'm your host, Mike Menninger, certified financial planner, owner and founder of Menninger & Associates Financial Planning. I am pleased again to have Brad Sorensen as my guest today. Uh, Brad is a chartered financial analyst, the CFA. Uh, again, uh, what I characterize as to be the most prestigious uh, designation in the industry of financial services. Uh, Brad is a member of the Cornerstone uh, Portfolio Research Team, and it's a group of CFAs that actually uh, we as a firm have hired. Uh, Brad's firm, and Brad's kind of our point guy. Uh, we talk to Brad every week, what's going on in the economy, what's going on here, all kinds of different economic indicators, because uh, we try to utilize this information to be able to help our clients with their hard-earned assets and investments. So Brad, thank you again uh, for joining me. I uh, appreciate it. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for having me. All right. So this is our fourth episode of doing this. Having fun yet? <laughs> yeah, no, we could probably stretch it into eight. Oh, we'll I know. You and I, uh, you know, we both love the topic and, you know, both of us can be talkative, especially when we're together. So um, <laughs> what we're going to do in today's episode, uh, probably in the first segment, we're going to talk about the dollar okay and the rising falling dollar whatever it might be and its impact on international investments okay up until now uh, we always talk about the s p 500 you know we were talking about fang stocks etc cetera, etc cetera. well all of that is is domestic domestic represents 40 percent is it four, wait are we 40 yeah, no we're 60 percent of the world stocks are us 40 percent is international therefore we can't ignore international can we no you can and that's what most people do tend to ignore and that happens in every country their home bias is what we call it but we do want to pay attention because what happens internationally can affect the u.s but also for investment purposes you want to have at least some exposure to the rest of the world for diversification purposes well and this has become a global economy i mean you take a, a look at I don't care what the company is, you know, McDonald's, let's say. They have, they have restaurants all over the world. Then you may even have a company that's based in the U.S., but sells to companies around the world. Or they may be based in the, uh, somewhere outside the U.S., in Europe or China, and most of the revenue comes from the United States. So it has really become a global economy. However, one of the things that really comes into play and this is something that i've noticed of course rearview mirror sometimes um, is the impact of the dollar and we have a chart showing the dollar index basically this represents the u.s dollar against what they refer to as a basket of currencies and generally speaking all things being equal if the dollar is falling then international investments <laughs> Excuse me. Will do well. Whereas if the dollar is rising, then US will do better against international investments. And so what we see here is from roughly 2002 all the way to 2008, it was a continuous decline in the dollar relative to international investments, which basically made that was the international bull market, wasn't it? Yeah, it definitely provided a tailwind. As you mentioned, there are many factors that affect investments internationally, but the dollar is kind of the, the tailwind or the headwind that affects international investments. And that was a pretty good period in general for international versus domestic, generally speaking. Well, so then you've got the second half of the chart that shows from roughly 2010 all the way up to... Uh, 2016, it was pretty much a straight line, uh, maybe not a straight line, but certainly a line up from 11 to 13, right. I'm sorry, 11 to 17, took a quick dip down, kind of went back up again, and then continued to race up. And so the irony is that if you, one were to look at this chart, there was only one period of time between 2011 and 2022 that the dollar dropped and that was in 2017. Well, the irony of it also happens to be that in that same 10 year period, every single year, the dollar was rising and international lagged the US, except for that year of 2017, 
where you saw that precipitous drop. In this case, the index went something like from 101, or shall I say 101. Uh, that's, that's the current one, uh, from like 101 down to 90. That was in one year, and that was in 2017, and that was the only year in that 10-year span where international stocks outperformed U.S. stocks. So it's very easy for, as they say, recency bias, although recency of 10 years is not exactly recent, but all those years, the U.S. just continued to outperform, but now the question is, where is the dollar going? And let's pop the graph back up because what we saw last quarter is we saw, I think it was an 8% drop in the dollar from the peak of 112.1 in September, dropped all the way down to 101 now. And in fact, most of that drop was just in Q4. Right. And so, in, Brad, I think you can- under Yeah, so the that's eyes. what we care about. That's what all investors care about is the forward looking and predicting currency movements is a, is a tough game to play because there's so many things that influence currency. But the things we can look at and we do know, first of all, if you just look, if you looked at the chart, the dollar was extremely high relative to history, relative to the other currencies. That occurred largely due because the interest rates went up here a lot faster than they did internationally. So people flocked to the dollar to get uh, take advantage of the higher interest rates that we had here. Well, now there's talk that the Fed is pausing, the speculation that the Fed will pause here, um, and international countries still have to catch up. There's still inflation. There's a, headlines almost every day or weekly that you know, England's inflation remains hot. Spain, Germany, they still have inflation issues. So they're having to continue to raise rates. And that, relatively speaking, like the dollar isn't weak historically, but it is weaker. And that benefits other foreign currencies, which benefits foreign stocks relative to domestic generally. Yeah, and that's why we saw a massive run in international stocks in Q4 of last year. Didn't they outperform domestic by almost 10%? Yes. Yeah, that was it. And that was kind of the, I guess, the trade of the century for those traders because the dollar had gotten so high that it had to decline a little bit. And they knew that even if international companies were struggling, they were going to get a tailwind from that dollar decline. Well, yeah. And, and so, you know, as you pointed out, the, you know, the dollar can have a lot to do with the interest rates in the representative companies and we are countries. And one of the things that we noticed, um, I think in 2001, as well as in 2008, the US is the leader over, let's say Europe, from the perspective of getting stuff done. And you know, I look at it and say, what is the EU 17 countries, maybe 16 now without England. But it's a lot easier for one president to make a decision and say, we're doing this. They did some of these decisions in 2001. They did some of these decisions in 2008. Meanwhile, Europe has to have 17 or now 16 nations or all sort of agree to do something and good luck with that. I mean, and that's why they always seem to be lagging behind. Is that a good assessment of it? Or is there a lot more behind it or what? Well, there's always a lot more, but yeah, that's a good assessment. And yeah, it's interesting to note though that the, I've always found this interesting, that the, the Fed's job is tough. They're, they're basically giving two opposing objectives, two mandates that we've talked about in previous episodes, <clears throat> price stability and job growth. Well, job growth leads to inflation. So they're kind of always fighting. They're trying to find that balance between the two and that's very difficult to find. Um, ECB, the European Central Bank only has one mandate and that's price stability. So they theoretically don't have to care about jobs but it is a political position so they do. Well, they have to deal with multiple countries. And I remember, it might've been 08, I keep forgetting which one it was, it might've been 08, that you had the ECB had to make decisions that benefited some countries and hurt other countries. So therefore, if it's a democracy 
of those union, or uh, if the EU, the European Union, is a democracy, well, you're going to have some infighting that's always going to delay their decisions. Oh, for sure. And there were there was talk during the financial crisis that they would, the ECB or the European Union would break up because Germany was having to pay the price for um, Greece and Italy and their economic decisions and their over indebtedness and right. Germany was, you know, having to pay for a lot of that and central bank was making decisions that would benefit those smaller countries, but then hurt Germany. So there's those conflicts have been going on and it still goes on where some countries have really high inflation and the ECB needs to tighten, but then there are some countries that are still struggling in the growth arena, don't have as high inflation, so they're arguing the opposite. So that's the fun game that the ECB gets to play. Of course. We don't have states really in the United States with the same kind of arguments that those countries have. Right, right, right. Well, and that's also why they're lagging behind. And also, yep. at, to your point, that they're probably going to need to continue to raise rates beyond the point with which we stopped, particularly for two reasons. One, we've already kind of talked about it, but two, our inflation's coming down, whereas Europe may be coming down, but it got higher than ours and it's still up there. So they're going to have to do something about it over there. So if they're raising their rates and ours are remaining the same or lowering, then that should really cause the dollar to decrease against international currencies. Yes. And so yeah, that's exactly right. And that's exactly they they have not been as aggressive. And for all the reasons that you said, but they are going to have to generally raise rates and they still probably won't be aggressive about it. But over the course of the year, the rates are projected to go higher and in the international realm. And I don't think they'll go a lot higher with the Fed. So that does argue for a weaker dollar. Well, and so the other thing that may be conspiracy theory, but you're hearing a lot about it on the news, is uh, the BRICS company, countries, which is, uh, you know, uh, Brazil, Russia, uh, India, China, and who's S? John a blank. There is no S. BRICS. Oh, it's just BRIC. The BRIC countries. It's, it's BRIC, but S because there's four countries. All right. So anyway, um, duh. So... They're talking about using their own currencies, and then there's the, oh my goodness, the dollar's going to go away and no longer be a world reserve currency. And, and I know we've heard before this happens periodically, and that the U.S. is just too big, and there's, we got too many tentacles with the dollar for us to fall away from. Can you care to try to respond to that in a minute or two? Oh, Mike, you know how to fire me up and then limit me to a minute. That's just <laughs> ridiculous. But um, yeah, so the dollar is not going away. Eventually it will because all currencies change. But in the next 50, 100 years, it's safe because you can always tell this. You'll hear this out of China. You hear this out of India that, hey, we want to start using these. And they will use that inner country with its trade between India and China, Brazil and China, sometimes they'll use the yen, sometimes they'll use the rupee, whatever. China wants to be the reserve currency. Well, it's not stable enough. That's a joke. That's never going to happen in our lifetimes um, because of the government, the freedom, the capital controls that they have, a lot of things. But the way you can tell is that anytime there is economic stress, where does everybody run? To the dollar. What do all these countries hold in reserve? The dollar. They all hold dollars. They all run to the dollar as soon as anything happens. And they all price things in dollars, even though they'll price them in other things. But at the end of the day, they still price them in dollars. So the dollar still, and it's the country behind it. We're still the capitalist leaders. We still have the safest, you know, they run to treasuries. And then we have the democracy government we have freedom of capital movement that all happens to generate the stable currency that needs to happen the other currencies are too volatile the ecb is too broken up so there's not really a good alternative at this point that's good last but not least we're going to circle back to the international we'll get back to the international valuations yeah i always believe that a, a, a picture is worth a thousand words and this reinforces 
what we were just talking about a little earlier, that from 19, I'm sorry, 19, from 2010 to like roughly 2021, this graph just shows a straight line down. Now what this is doing is it's comparing, correct me if I'm wrong, it's comparing the PE ratios of the US versus international, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, and the PE ratios versus, and the PE ratios of the U.S. are, as you can see, the chart shows that PE ratios in the U.S. are generally always higher than they are um, internationally. The U.S. gets a premium because of our countries and our regulations and our government and all of that. But the historic ratio stays the same, and that's why we look at that. And you can see here that it is near a, it, it goes, if you went back further, it's a multi-decade low, but it's at a, at least a two-decade low from this chart. Yeah, the only concern I have with something like this is that you think, oh, is this going to be a head fake? Because you could have argued the same thing like five years ago and say, oh my goodness, it's at a one standard deviation away. It can only go up from here. Next thing you know, it continues to go down. But we're two standard deviations, which statistically speaking means that there's a nine, only a 5% chance that we go below that line. That's right. You know, and so now, that's what when it comes to investing, sometimes you just have to, you, all the time you just play the you have to play the odds like we don't know what's going to happen could we could we go lower yeah that that's definitely a possibility could we languish here for a while yes but if you look at history like you said there's a 95 percent probability that we do bounce off of these levels and go up there's a good probability that the dollar weakens which gives international uh, a tailwind so i am not the biggest international fan um in the world i don't love international investing normally but in the environment that we're in having some international exposure does make sense right here due to valuations and the movement of the dollar it seems like you have two fundamental reasons why international should outperform the u.s at least in the foreseeable future that doesn't happen all that often where you get these things lining up does it mean it happens for sure? No, but we have to play the odds when we invest. Agreed. A couple good compelling arguments leaning towards international. Brad, we're up against break. Um, so please stay tuned. We will be back with you in just a few more moments. Do you keep up regularly with your investments? Where exactly are your hard-earned dollars going? Are you financially prepared for an emergency? I'm Mike Manager, founder of Manager & Associates Financial Planning. We believe that education and knowledge are powerful, and we want our clients to understand why we are making the recommendations that we make. It's your money, and you deserve to know where it's going, because it's not how much you make, it's how much you keep. So call us today to dis- Welcome back to Financial Plan and Explained. I'm your host, Mike Manager, Certified Financial Planner and with Chartered Financial Analyst, Brad Sorensen. Um, this is sort of where we kind of wrap things up a little bit on where do we go from here. So therefore, we're going to all have this on documentation. We're going to hold you to it. <laughs> I'm only kidding. Go right um, ahead. But I want to go back to a slide that we had shown a few episodes earlier, which is the Fed funds rate over time. And mm -hmm. what we're going to see here is, um, and it's not up. Can you pop the slide, please? Um, the Fed funds rate was almost zero for many years, okay? And then all of a sudden in 2015, it climbed up again because they were raising rates coming off the 2008. Then they dropped down to zero again. Okay, right at the time of um, the pandemic. But now they're raising rates and they were raising rates. But what's most important about this is that you actually have on this slide, it shows both the Fed expectations of where rates are going to be, as well as the bond market expectation. And what you see here in both cases is that they're expecting rates to drop by 2%. Mm -hmm. 
over the course of the next year or two. So what does that mean? Well, let me tell you something. That means a lot. And to start with, if everyone is projecting that they're going to lower rates, fundamentally, what does that mean? They're projecting that the U.S. is going to go into a recession and that they're going to have to lower rates to stimulate the economy. Would you agree with that? Well, I think it's saying two different things. And this explains the gap between the two lines. The bond market is suggesting it cuts later this year. Right now, the bond market and this chart is a little bit old, but the bond market right now is forecasting three rate cuts at the third quarter, fourth quarter of this year, 100 basis points by the spring of next year. The only way that can happen, in my view, is if we get a pretty good recession. It's hard to imagine the Fed just going, hey, things are going along okay. Inflation is down to 3%, so let's just start cutting rates. The, Powell's pounded the table that that's not going to happen. And um, other Fed, they've come out explicitly. They're usually not this and say, no, we're not cutting this year, absent some exogenous thing happening that we're not seeing right now. The, the Fed's projections are more that economic growth will slow over time. Time inflation will come down, which will enable them to slowly cut rates to make them more normalized, to stimulate growth a little bit. They're doing it in response to, they believe they're not pushing the economy into a recession. They're believing that they will, their inflation fighting will be successful. They'll be able to get out of the low growth and stimulate growth going forward into 24 and 25 as they cut rates to do that, but not recover from a recession. That's what they're forecasting. So that's where the conflict is between the bond market and the Fed right now. Well, it's interesting. I can't help but laugh under my breath when you said the Fed believes this and the Fed believes this. Well, okay, guess what? We're, the, we're from the government and we're here to help. <laughs> so the long and short of it is that there seems to be a, a precipitous that they're going to be lowering interest rates. Well, let's assume they do for a moment, okay? I believe that they will. I mean, there, you know, all the evidence is pointing to it, including that. So the impacts of them dropping interest rates are twofold. Let's back up and look at 2022. Okay, in 2022, uh, we'll talk about the bond market. The bond market, they've had the aggregate, the Barclays Aggregate Bond Index has been around since 1976, measuring the bond market. And going into 2022, the worst year the bonds ever had was in 1994, where they lost 3.4%. Okay, fine. Well, guess what? They lost 13% last year, bonds. Okay, now bonds and stocks typically react the opposite of each other. Okay, bonds are doing well, stocks are stinking up the joint and vice versa because they're selling bonds to buy stocks and vice versa. Well, sometimes you'll have both of them run in the same direction. Well, usually that's created by an external event. What type of external event could possibly be? A pandemic, gee, go figure, okay? Stocks and bonds both drop precipitously, almost hand in hand for like five weeks. And last year, Bonds got cremated because of the fact that bonds react the opposite of interest rates. If the government's raising interest rates, then the value of bonds are going to drop. And that's what we experienced. Now, if everything drops when they're raising interest rates, what's that tell you about when they're lowering interest rates? Well, typically what will happen is kind of the exact opposite. The the, there'll be a tailwind behind bond prices and there will be a tail because <laughs> prices and yields are inverted and there'll be a tailwind behind stocks. There's more liquidity out there. There's more lending that benefits companies. So typically that's what you'll see. You'll see the stock market start to outperform usually in the middle of a recession because this market starts to anticipate the Fed cutting rates and 
jump ahead of that stimulus that's going to come into the economy because the stock market, as we've talked about, is a leading indicator. So that's what would happen. But, you know, that's moving out in the future. What happens between now and then? That's sort of the question over the next six to 12 months. Do we get a pullback in the market and then get the acceleration? Well, that's always the trick to investing. And that's, as you pointed out, why you want to try to stay invested. Because if the train right. leaves the station without you, that's not good. But at the same time, too, uh, you don't want to be investing really heavily when there's very good reason to believe that we may be heading into a recession. And you raised a very valid point in that the markets, the stock markets, are a leading economic indicator and that a perfect example of that and, and that they often the market begins to go up when you're in the middle of a recession now kind of a bad example but it's sort of a good example when did the markets begin to rise in during the pandemic they began to rise the moment the fed came out and said we're providing stimulus including lowering interest rates okay yep. and we hadn't even really been in the recession yet maybe a little bit but that was on march 23rd of 2020 the markets hit their peak on february 19th hit their bottom on march 23rd and took off and the recession really hit us hard in march april may and june because that's when we had all the people being laid off etc cetera, etc cetera. so one would hope that if the fed announces that it's going to be doing um rate cuts that that will almost have an immediate response by the bond market but that may have a favorable response by the stock market because if the stock market is a leading indicator of where the economy is going to be in six to nine months then that's suggesting that these interest rate cuts are going to potentially be good for the stocks and bonds would you agree with that yeah definitely if the market starts to anticipate the stock market starts to anticipate those cuts, there will be a rally on that. Well, I look forward to those rate cuts <laughs> as we wrap up this episode. Brad, thank you very much. I kind of led you into answering the question that I kind of stated, but, um, but regardless, I, I greatly appreciate your input today and for each of the three previous episodes that we did. Uh, I hope that the viewers um, enjoyed this found this provocative and uh, learned something. Uh, Brad, thank you again. I look forward to having you back on the show. You're an absolutely terrific guest, very easy to talk through with. Um, so thank you again. And thank you for all of the viewers. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And I look forward to seeing you in the next time uh, that I have another episode of Financial Planning Explained. So uh, have a wonderful day and a wonderful week.